Hello everyone, good evening. I hope you had a nice <laughs> good evening. Good evening. Okay, uh, I think everyone's there, so we start our last uh, session on uh, knowledge management in organizations. Uh, okay, first of all, let's look at this style for a slide for a while and see what do we get out of it. Uh, what, how often we are too slow to recognize how much and in what ways we can assist each other through sharing such experience and knowledge. Here we have a couple of bullet points. There are things we know, things we think we know but we don't, things we don't know, things we don't know we don't know, and things we don't want to know, and things we know but we don't share. So there are a lot of confu confusing stuff with know and don't know and want to know. The point here is that it doesn't matter if you know or you don't know because what matters is that knowing something is a conscious decision. That's the point. In fact, Knowing something is a conscious decision and that knowing is a matter of making a decision to know. How we decide to embark on knowing and in knowledge management in the course we have decided to know the relevant knowledge and we have decided to share the relevant knowledge because we want other people to know. So it's a very active conscious decision. It doesn't happen like that. So what is actually knowledge management? Knowledge management is the structured and international collection and distribution, uh, sorry, is, is the structured and intentional collection and distribution of information to support learning. So. These are the elements involved. The element of a structure, which you see here, and as I told you, is intentional. Intentional means you want to do that. It doesn't happen by chance. Collection and distribution of information. But what is the purpose of knowledge management? To support learning. And, and about the purpose of knowledge management, we will discuss this. Uh, later in later slides, but for now you have to know that we manage the knowledge to support learning. <clears throat> so, where should knowledge management be or who should manage it? We have different departments and we have human resource department, we have accounting and decision making and finance, we have sales and marketing, we have customer service, we have IT management. So, we have a lot of departments and the question is, where should it be? Who should it manage it? In fact, let's have an example. For example, if somebody in human resource management department want to have voice conferencing with uh, human resource personnel in other branches in other countries, human resource wants to have a knowledge sharing but they need the IT employees knowledge to, and know-how and this tactical and technical skills in order to go on about it. So you are in HR, you want to use your video conferencing but you need the IT people's expertise. So it is not a matter of what department you work for but it is about what know-how you possess and know-how that you possess can be used in any department. 
No, it cannot be unintentional, Allah. It's very intentional. It is decision. It is you make the decision very clearly that I want to manage knowledge. Management. If you say that management can be management of knowledge can be unintentional, so you are actually undermining the whole philosophy behind management. Management is not an unintentional process. Management in itself is, a, is an intentional process. That's why we, we study management and we study knowledge management, we study innovation management, we study strategic management. Whatever management you study, it is intentional, it is a conscious decision, behind it there is science, behind it there is art. So, no, we don't have um, unintentional management of knowledge. Even when you use your telephone directory, you have an address book, right? Do you organize your address book unintentionally? If if you do it automatically, that doesn't mean that it's unintentional because the first time your father gave you the first address book, your father taught you how to use an address book, but you don't remember. Because you don't remember, you think that you organize your address book unintentionally. No, you do it intentionally, but you don't remember when you started the, 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 the decision-making process. Knowledge management is an intentional process. That's it. Full stop. Finish. Why need knowledge management now? Well, this is a very important uh, question because this is this explains that knowledge is the hostage of the individual in an organization. Data, information, and knowledge are locked up at individual level. They are hostages. Through interaction in a team context, new knowledge is created, but this is at the team level, and it does not go further. So now knowledge is not a hostage of an individual. Knowledge is taken hostage at a team level. So. This is very important. An entire business model is changing. When the whole business model is changing, we need to create value through innovative products and services. And we know that pro innovation feeds on ideas, feeds on information, feeds on knowledge, feeds on wisdom. So when knowledge is not shared, we cannot innovate. And the newly fresh generated knowledge will not diffuse through the organization if it is taken hostage at an individual level or at, a, at an organizational level and therefore innovation doesn't happen. So in a world that is changing continuously and rapidly with more and more complex business environments, the speed and the amount of knowledge sharing within organization determines organizational flexibility to respond to market needs through innovation of new products and services. So if your organization does not share knowledge, is not a knowledge sharing organization, doesn't have processes and doesn't have a management process for that, you lose your flexibility to respond to market needs. That is how knowledge management is linked to innovation management. Because when you lose your flexibility to respond to the market needs, in fact, you lose innovating new products and services. And that's very dangerous. Data, information, and knowledge. We need to make a distinction between data information and knowledge. Well, I could, for example, write this here. 
0, 0, 0. So what is it? What just have I written there? Is data? Is the number? So a set of discrete objective facts about events. That's data. So this is a data. If I put a dash here and I make it more look like a telephone number. What can it be? When I put it as here, now you have 514 here. Now if you live in Canada, you know that one five one four is Montreal. So this can be the telephone number and this can be the area code. So when you put dash and you organize data, you move one step higher to information. So information is facts with context and perspective. The data which is more representative of reality is called information. Five on its own, five, one, four doesn't tell you anything but then there is like this with parenthesis and maybe a little bit of a sign here of a telephone, you get that this is an information. But it's still, uh, but it's still, we we don't know what to do with this because this is just a piece of information. Then we have to go one step higher which is knowledge, which is information with guidance or action. Knowledge is needed to understand the relationships between different pieces of information. So how can I make this knowledge? How can I uh, make this a guidance for an action? So what we're looking for here is at this level of knowledge, we need a guidance for action. How can I make this a guidance for action? What is your proposition? What is your suggestion? If I say that in case of emergency, okay, this is the number. If I say that in case of emergency, call Obaidullah Faisal, who is the head of emergency, fire for example emergencies, at this number. Then this number is meaningful, provides you with guidance for action. So, in knowledge management, we work with data, we work with information, we work with knowledge. We need to always go up the stream in order to have a meaningful knowledge. And then when we have the knowledge, we have to share it. 
and we need to distinguish between these three because each of them has certain level of importance. Knowledge absolutely is more important than information and information is absolutely important, more important than data because you can do more with information than, da than with data and you can do more with knowledge than with information. So, once again, let's review data, information and knowledge and then explain the next step. In an organizational context, data is described as structured records of transactions. So if you pay 200000 to buy a machine and you record it in your accounting department, you have a piece of recorded data. All, in, all organizations need uh, data and some industries are heavily dependent on it, like banks. In banking industry, you always work with data. In insurance company, you always work with data. And in utilities and a few government agencies, you always work with data. You say, we consume this much of uh, electricity and this much of electricity costs this much. So you always have numbers, raw data there. Record, keep, record keeping is essential in these data cultures and also effective data management is essential to that success, to the success of the company. So in here, we don't have knowledge management, we have data management. And if you have an Excel sheet, you can manage your data. But for many companies, more data is always better because, is not always better because too much data can it can make it harder to identify and make sense of the data that matters. So you have a lot of data, but 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 you are looking for a certain data, and too too much data is always a burden. So the reason is that data carries no meaning. There is no inherent meaning to data. So if you have too much data and there is no meaning to it. You don't know what to do with it. Data says nothing about its own importance or relevance. 514 doesn't say anything about its importance. But data is important because it is essential raw material. So it is the raw material for creation of information. And that makes data important. Information, on the other hand, is meant to change the way the receiver perceives something, finally. For example, when this this data is created, there is a change, there is a, there is a change in the recipient because the recipient understands a relationship. And after that, uh, finally, when this knowledge is accumulated over time, we come up with something which we call wisdom because here we have understanding of the relationships. Here we have patterns because we have information, sales information, customer information, customer support information, and then we have pattern, and this pattern is knowledge. And over time, this accumulated, this accumulated knowledge becomes wisdom. So if you say somebody is very wise, it means that this guy has a large amount of accumulated knowledge. So wisdom can be gained through a combination of academic study and personal experience. Wisdom is beyond knowledge. It allows you to understand how to apply concepts from one domain to new situations or problems. So wisdom is where you are an engineer and then you study MBA and you use the knowledge of engineering and you mix it with your knowledge of management and you create something new. So 
this process happens if you have a lot of wisdom. So here we have information. This guy knows the sun. Uh, this guy knows the sun exists. This guy knows the rabbit exists. This guy knows there are grasses everywhere. These are all information, but he has always this question mark here. So what? In the knowledge part, this guy says rabbits eat grass. Grass grows in soil. Rain falls from clouds. Wolves eat rabbits, etc., etc., etc. So what? This is a knowledge, this is an understanding, because he understands that rabbits, the relationship between rabbits, if, if we go back to this slide, understanding the patterns is knowledge, and understanding relationship is information. So, we have sun, we have rabbits. Now he, he tries to figure out understanding the relationship and a pattern. When it comes to knowledge, rabbit eats grass, grass grows in soil. This is the pattern of relationships. Rabbit eats grass is relationship. But when all these relationships are put together, there is a pattern. He is about to discover that pattern. If we if I kill off all the wolves the rabbits will eat up the grass because ra rabbits are not going to be hunted by, by the wolves and the soil will all wash away. So, accumulated knowledge is, is when he applies all the relationships in the knowledge side, the pattern between them uh, which exists there and then he draws a very logical conclusion. So. If he is a wise person, as he is, he draws a conclusion. The conclusion is, if you disturb the balance of nature, if you kill all the wolves, wolves do not eat rabbits, rabbits will eventually eat all the grass, then when it rains, the rains will wash away everything. Okay, so what is actually knowledge? Knowledge is the resource in the new economy. So we look at knowledge as a resource. It's like money. It's something that enables a person or machine to solve problem of certain type. So it's a problem solver. It's it's an enabler it's an enabler to solve problems. Is more than information. Is information that has been read and understood. So it is an understood information knowledge. Rabbit eats grass. We know rabbits exist. We know the sun exists. We know the wolves exist. We know the grass exists. Okay, but when you know that rabbit eats grass, then you have understood the information. Knowledge comes in many varieties. We know people, places, and things. We know how to perform tasks. We know facts. So the way that we know how to perform tasks, it's our knowledge. Which one is more important? We have explicit knowledge assets and we have tacit knowledge assets. Which one is more important?
if if you say why if you say tacit knowledge you should tell me why why tacit knowledge is more important the why is here the question Why? What, what is in tacit knowledge? What is the quality of tacit knowledge that makes it important? Okay. It's the base of explicit knowledge. Okay. Tacit knowledge assets often reflect an organization's best practices and procedures and processes that are widely accepted as being among the most effective and or efficient knowledge. Therefore, you know, identifying how to recognize, generate, store, share, and manage this tacit knowledge is the primary objective for developing knowledge management system. Tacit knowledge is important because it has to do with the best practices in the industry. You know, explicit knowledge, in the next slide when we see, explicit knowledge is formal and systematic. Okay? It is expressed in words and numbers. It is easy to communicate. It is in the form of information. It is rules like, like when you buy a TV. The manual with the TV is, the ta is an explicit knowledge. If you lose this manual, you go to the TV shop. You say, can you please give me another manual? And the guy gives you another manual. So when you lose explicit knowledge, it doesn't matter because you can buy it. If, if you lose a formula, you go to internet, you lose your math book uh, right the night before your exam, you you, your math book is probably somewhere you can't find and probably is swimming in the river, you can't find it. You go and to the library and borrow a math book, all the formulas are there, all the principles are there. You don't lose anything. So explicit knowledge is important, but if you lose it, it doesn't matter. It's also very easy to manage because it's tangible. Tacit knowledge, on the other hand, is more important than the explicit knowledge because it, is, it exists in your head. If you uh, if you you cannot buy it, you cannot replace it, you cannot do anything with it. It just is there. It is subjective. It is knowledge of experience. So the night before your math exam, mathematic exam, if you lose your book, it doesn't matter. But if you have a headache and you cannot use your experience collected throughout the semester from uh, practicing the practice tests, then you are in a serious trouble. Not easily expressible, highly personal, hard to formalize, difficult to communicate, it's in form of ideas, all emotions are tacit knowledge, and value. So, there are certain features to knowledge and you need this to know these feature, feature, features of knowledge because if you want to manage something you should know what it is what qualities does this kind of thing has that you want to manage knowledge is a scarce it means that it's not something that you never run out of it. Okay, you can produce it, but within your organization, it is a scarce resource. Not everyone has it, and 
it's not something that you don't run out of it because it's based on experience. A person has gone through certain milestone in his life and has collected some knowledge. It's limited. But it's producible. If you send your engineers to training, they become experienced, they can produce knowledge. It can be owned. Of course, when you are an engineer and you uh, have a patent, uh, patent for inventing wheel or patent, let's say wheel, why not? Uh, you invent uh, wheel and just let me check something. You invent wheel and then you get a patent for your wheel and you own the knowledge. So it can be owned it can vanish if I steal if I steal your patent then then this patent vanishes if I steal all the books that you have done the formulas and everything it is true that part of the knowledge is in your mind in a tacit form but if you're a great uh, scientist you do a lot of calculations to reach your fa final formula so I can steal all your books and you are in trouble. Part of it is in your head, part of, it, part of your knowledge is in your books. It can be stored, of course it can be stored, because uh, you are a, a novelist, you write 100 novels during your lifetime and probably you can remember 10 of it, but 90 of your novels out of 100 are in the bookstore in your lot in your book bookshelves so you store them you store all your knowledge nowadays in your computer it's transferable when you email to someone you transfer your knowledge to someone through PDF attachments it is intangible and it can be tangible it's tradable you can sell your patent to a third party Wealth creating, you can license McDonald's patent to people and make a lot of money out of it. Now you have McDonald's everywhere. You, you, the knowledge of McDonald's is patentable and, and it's reusable. You can use it, reuse it, reuse it, and that's it. So, the relationship knowledge is intangible but when you turn your knowledge into material like you have certain knowledge in your brain how to build a wheel of course the knowledge itself is intangible but when you build the wheel the wheel becomes tangible so the impact of knowledge is tangible the impact of knowledge can be tangible. If you make a product out of it, the knowledge itself is intangible, but if you make a wheel, then the wheel is tangible. If the knowledge is intangible, but you make a new product, the new product is in is tangible so you move from intangible to tangible so relationship between knowledge and management management is generally defined as an action to make decision and coordinate resources to run certain activity aha uh -huh. now look here what do we have here we have coordinate resources is knowledge a resource? Yes. So you make a decision and you coordinate knowledge. So knowledge can be managed. Knowledge is essential resource in management practice today. Again, we have to do with resource. So we, we look at knowledge as a resource that can be managed.
both knowledge and management are human based. True. Knowledge is within your head and your head is within your human body. Management is the job of manager and he is also a human as well. What knowledge management is and is not? Knowledge management is the management of uncertainty, is the management of future development, is the management of obstacles and adversities, is the management of innovation. So, in fact, when, when the situation is uncertain, if you don't know, for example, about the stock market, okay? Let's, let's go to the example of stock market. In a stock market, everything is uncertain, okay? But if somebody gives you information about what is going to happen next month with this company, your uncertainty is reduced. So, by managing knowledge and information, you reduce your uncertainty. The guy tells you this company A is going to sign a contract with a Japanese company and this contract is going to bring in a lot of money. If I say that company A is going just to sign a contract is a piece of information. But you discover a patent between signing a contract, you sign the contract, and this signing a contract leads to a lot of dollar amounts. There is a pattern here. There is a knowledge. So this knowledge reduces the level of uncertainty. Therefore, the management of uncertainty is knowledge management. And it goes through for the rest. Knowledge management is not IT management. Because many people think of IT as knowledge management. IT is a technology information technology. Technology by itself is not management. Management is more than technology. You use technology to manage better. Now let's look at the benefits of knowledge management. Process outcomes, efficiency, marketing, uh, sorry, process outcomes. Let's let's do one by one because I don't want to confuse you. So we we first focus on process outcome and we have communication and we have efficiency. In communication, it's the, the benefits of knowledge management realizes it enhanced communication, faster communication, more visible opinions, increased participation. So when you have knowledge management processes at place, the communication enhances. Reduce problem solving time because when the knowledge is shared and managed, then everybody accesses the required knowledge. So there is a reduced time for problem solving. Shortening proposal times. People get in touch with each other easily. Faster results, faster delivery to market, and greater overall efficiency. All these are minor results of knowledge management. Now, look at the benefits of knowledge management as organizational outcomes.
we have financial, we have marketing, and we have general benefits in organizational outcomes. Sale increases, you get more money. Cost decreases, you get more money. Profitability is higher. It's all financial benefits of knowledge management as organizational outcomes. Marketing. If you manage knowledge, and, and I'm going to show you more practically how you do it, just give, let's take this example. Uh, by knowledge management, for example, in marketing, I mean, you have certain information about your customers and information is relationship between some data, okay? And you understand them, of course, as part of information. But knowledge has to do with understanding patterns. You have certain information about your customers you have a customer service which deals with this information. They manage this information. They find patterns among this information. And they know how to respond to customers better. If customers call and say that this product is defect, they collect this piece of information and then they go to the development of the product design department and they say that uh, customers say that this product is defect many customers complain what are your answers they look at the product they say uh-huh and they have to use the product like this so now you have a knowledge because there is a pattern uh, you observe between the defect product and customer calls and the responses of the product design department. So you put these information together, you come up with a pattern that if this happens, this happens. So you reach a conclusion and you provide a better service to customers. And this is the organizational outcome, uh, the benefit of knowledge management in terms of organizations. So you see that knowledge management how practically, then you don't look at it as an abstract term. Look at it as a very practical term. Look at it as something very goal-oriented. You have a goal when you manage knowledge. It's not like that you want to manage knowledge because you have to manage knowledge. No. You have a certain goal. And this goal is, is what you have here. You want to have knowledge management at the service of marketing. You have knowledge management at the service of reducing effic uh, increasing efficiency. You want knowledge management that increases communication. You want knowledge management that makes you money, brings some financial information to you. If, if you know that increased sales, you, you sell, for example, um, bikinis, and you know that uh, these uh, schools in the neighborhood are sending their uh, students to to a beach for a summer holiday. This is a piece of information. There is no pattern. They send the students to the beach. Girls go to the beach. And another piece of information is that you sell bikinis and you have a very strong uh, teenage department bikinis. And then you put this information together and then you approach the school and sell the bikinis. So, uh, you have a pattern of knowledge that leads to increased sales. So that's how knowledge management helps you. And of course, in, the, in improved project management and personal reduction, uh, personnel reduction, it means that you don't need so many people to do simple jobs. Um, hold on a second, please.
Well, now we have knowledge um, as a way towards innovation. And we want highly innovative organization, and we want to see how knowledge management uh, can help us. In fact, the benefits of knowledge management always pave the way towards innovation, because innovation is a collective activity. So even if one may come up with an original idea, yet he needs a team to pool the knowledge. You have an idea. Idea is like one single element, but you need to have wisdom. You have accumulated knowledge, a pool of knowledge, and you need physical resources, and all of these together materialize the innovative ideas. Therefore, uh, you need to think of it as a collective process. Marketing is involved. Uh, financial matters need to be managed. The general factors should be there. All, all these departments and all these concentrations. If you have an innovation, innovative idea which doesn't care for efficiency, this innovative idea is not going to be helpful. So you need to see how this is going to benefit the organization in financial terms, in efficiency terms, in, in reducing communication time. So knowledge management is at the service of innovation management, but at some times it is parallel to innovation management. Because when you, you have, for example, enhanced communication, enhanced communication increases the chances for success of innovation projects on the other hand, knowledge management as a single management process, apart from innovation, can also increase sales, can also decrease cost. So you may not innovate something new, but because you have a knowledge management process at place targeted at organizational outcomes, you, you, by sharing the knowledge, you avoid problems, you avoid losses, and this decreases the loss and decreases the cost of production. So knowledge management in itself has a lot of benefits, but it also is an enabler to innovation process. Key challenges of knowledge management. We have management challenges, we have technology challenges, and we have information challenges. Let's look at them each. What are information challenges? Building vast amounts of data into usable formats. Avoid overloading users with unnecessary data eliminating wrong or old data, ensuring customer confidentiality. These are all challenges which fall under innovation challenges. There are also technology challenges. Determining responsibility for managing the knowledge. Determining infrastructure requirements keeping up with the new technologies, security of data on the internet. All of these are very technical and technology related challenges. And, and you see that in, in, in knowledge management, we deal with information and technology very much. That's how we manage them. Infrastructure you need a huge, uh, when, you, when you want to manage knowledge, you need huge uh, storehouses 
with big computers and processors and you know when you when you have a computer the old computers with a with a hard drive next to it this is how you store the data you don't store the data on monitor you store the data on a hardware and imagine uh, you are uh, coca cola or you are for example toyota you have a lot of customers you have a lot of data on your customers and you have a lot of data on your suppliers and you have to store this data and you have to protect this data so where do you keep them on a cool disk on a CD or you need huge data storage boxes for for electronic data storage the best example would be that one day you can go to your company and ask your IT manager to show you their their data storage room. Uh, there are huge computers in a room with no air in it because in case of fire there is no air inside so that the fire does not break out very fast. Very well protected. Uh, the offices, these, these storage houses are are normally uh, at low temperature and, and these are all the infrastructure which are very costly and, and you need to take care of them. So keeping information current is the management side. Change management implications, getting individuals to share knowledge voluntarily, how, to mot how you motivate people to give up their tacit knowledge because, because tacit knowledge is in their mind and, and if, if they don't want to talk about it, you can force them. Let me see if, if I can take you again to, to, to cast knowledge. Uh -huh. You see, tacit knowledge is here. How are you going to force people to tell you what is here? This is okay, you can detect it. This one, you cannot. So, so it's very difficult you have to come up with a motivational process to motivate people to to really tell you how the thing is done getting business units to share knowledge demonstrating business value how you should show them how their knowledge if shared is going to bring value to to create value for the organization bringing together people from various units so all these are three concerns or key concerns related to knowledge management application. Now we have the loss and profit of knowledge management. The loss uh, is the missed opportunities, wasted time, and operational inefficiencies represented which represent a severe competitive disadvantage. You know, loss is not always you lose money. Loss is also when you lose an opportunity. That is also loss. Uh, they all contribute to excessive cost. If you lose an opportunity, if you have wasted time, if you have inefficiencies which increases your cost of production and decreases your revenues. These are all poor bottom line performances because the bottom line is you don't make as much as money that you have to make and you don't have as much as profit as you have to have. The profit side of it is also very clear. Alternatively, if you were able to promote new ideas, to capture and share experience, to combine different areas of expertise as, as, when, as and when required, then you can have successful innovation projects which help organizations gain a source of considerable competitive advantage. The bottom line is knowledge management helps you to be an innovative organization therefore you are competitive you are ahead of competition and therefore you stay in business and keep making profit 
This is the promise of knowledge management. This is how you profit. So, now let me introduce to you the three myths in knowledge management. Build it and they will come. Technology can replace face-to-face -face and interactions. First, create a learning culture. Miss one. Build it and they will come. Well, when thinking of knowledge management, some organizations have this mental image of a warehouse only. They think building a central electronic database. And the central electronic database is the same as what I call just infrastructure. Oh, let me write it here because then something comes there. Infrastructure. This is an infrastructure, okay? So, these organizations think building a central electronic database and spending a considerable amount of money equals the process of knowledge management. What happens then? As a result, very little happens. It, in fact, you don't get what you expect. Neither contributions nor retrievals occur with much enthusiasm. The reality is that uh, they should change the image of their house to something else, and that something else is a, is a departure from collecting and a storing to reusing. So we don't only collect because it's not a museum. Knowledge management is not a museum. Knowledge management is a workshop. You collect because you want to reuse. And if you miss on this part, if you do not reuse it, then your knowledge management fails. So change your mentality. Not only collect, but reuse. Another myth in knowledge management is technology cannot replace face to face face-to-face. Uh, face. Well, the fact here is that some people think that if they have getting people together is costly. So, if you wa want people to share their knowledge with, with, with one another, they need to fly to other branches, like technical managers of branch A should fly to another country in order to sit together with technical manager of branch B in order to share their knowledge, like what they are doing here. They are sharing knowledge here. Okay? On the other side is when talking and training programs they are done in conferences with the help of IT. Look at here. We have the, the IT people set up this video conference. These are from one branch. These are from another branch. And they are doing the face-to-face -face, uh, face -face conference called video conference. And they share knowledge. Well, the happy marriage between technology and face-to-face -face interaction creates the most effective system. So, it's not about replacing. You know, it's about having both. You know, you are not supposed to think that technology cannot replace face-to-face. -face. No. Technology does replace face-to-face but you need also face-to-face -face interaction as well. So what we have here is that the happy marriage between technology and face-to-face -face interaction that creates the most effective systems. 
one does not replace the other. So if you think that technology is enough, we don't need face-to-face -face interaction anymore, is wrong, is a myth. If you think that we only need face-to-face -face and we don't need technology to enable us to remove this, is wrong. Because if you want to only have face-to-face, -face, it's very expensive. If you only want to have technology here and forget about this one, it's also not efficient because you also need personal touch. And in order to keep the balance here, you need a happy marriage. You need face-to-face -face interaction through technology. But one does not replace the other. Also, clearly, one can, gener can greatly enhance or complement the other. Through technology, allow people to share knowledge without having to be in the same place. But also, you need them to be together as well. So you need face-to-face -face interactions as well as video conferencing. You need both of them, not only one. So the myth talks about the fact that one thing either this replaces this one or this replaces this one. No, this is not a fact. Both of them should be there. We have talking together. We have video conferencing. The last, the third and the last myth is the first, create a learning culture. Well, competitive culture is the one that no one is going to tell anyone else something that might help the other person to get ahead. Because in a competitive culture, if I share my knowledge with you, you can do my job in order to keep my job, in order to progress, I don't share with you my knowledge. A knowledge sharing uh, only happens in organizations with a non-competitive and a collaborative culture. So change the culture. If people begin sharing ideas about issues, they see as really important the sharing itself creates a learning culture. So, um, competitive culture is seen as one of the big barriers in the process of knowledge management. In this culture, no one is going to tell anyone else something that stops him from growing. But how can we have these collaborative cultures? We have to change the culture. If people begin sharing ideas about issues, they see it as very important to progress. Therefore, the sharing itself creates learning the culture. So, Creating a learning culture is not something that you have to do it as a, as a matter of handmade thing. Because when people start sharing the, the, the ideas, when you have knowledge management processes that helps people share the ideas, P stands for processes, they see the impact of this knowledge sharing and therefore the, the learning culture itself is being created. Sharing process, the sharing process leads to the culture, makes the culture. You just need to enable this process and facilitate this process. The competition should not be between individuals in a sense that they stop the, the sharing knowledge. 
So you cannot say zero competition. You know, um, in, in, in very innovative organizations, they share the knowledge very much. They, they, they have processes for sharing knowledge. And individuals, in order to promote, are not scored based on keeping knowledge. They are scored based on sharing knowledge. They are scored based on teamwork. So if in your organization teamwork and team success is a reason for promoting people so that they can climb up the ladder of promotion based on their team spirit, team leadership, teamwork, group success, therefore the impact of individualism reduces and people start sharing the knowledge. Okay. There are three enablers of knowledge transfer. Culture, technology, infrastructure. Well, first enabler, culture. Well, cultural overhaul to-do list. Believe people want to share. Help colleagues learn from others, etc. So people generally want to share. Prepare to lead. If the sharing happens from top down, your actions uh, speak louder than words, meaning that when employees see that the managers share their knowledge willingly with the employees, it is already sending the message that we encourage a sharing knowledge culture. Overhaul means repair. Cultural overhaul, overhaul means to, re, to change, to repair your culture. Develop collaborative relationships. When you, when you create project teams and communities of practice, it means that the manager creates some islands and link these together. This is the system that you build and you let the people collaborate with each other. This collaboration, when you want to collaborate, what do you do? You share your knowledge. Automatically creates the culture. Instill personal responsibility for knowledge. Knowledge creation and sharing, including office space design. Well, this is not very new because for many years, in organizations, they have removed the walls. They have a big hall, and everybody sitting in the hall with the with the desk face to face. The design of the office itself promotes knowledge sharing because it promotes contact and face to face contact. It promotes being close together. Automatically, you talk, and when you get into talking you get into sharing and collaborating. Create a collaborative, collective sense of purpose. I told you, knowledge management is, should be linked to a purpose, to a goal. So, if this collective sense of purpose, if this goal is shared, people, all individuals, look towards the same direction. Therefore, when everybody thinks of the same thing, they have, there is a good chance that they talk together and share together their thoughts. And the knowledge is shared and created. To reward and not to reward. A standard reward system. We need to have a standardized reward system. 
Why is standardized? Because we want to remove biases. If there is no bias, if the, there is transparency, you are motivated to share because you know that when you share your knowledge and something good happens, you are going to be rewarded for that. In still personal, where is it? Ah, in still personal responsibility for knowledge creation means to make personal responsibility within individual. In still is, is making something in something. In still is to teach someone to, to think, behave, or or feel in a in a way. Uh, when when you instill personal responsibility, you you you, you ma make people to think like this. The second enabler is technology. IT is for knowledge management like a bathroom in is for a house buyer. Essential because without it the house is not even considered by buyers. So if there is no bathroom you don't buy the house. But the bathroom is generally not the vital differentiating factor for the buyer. So the main point is that technology should be there. Is 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 a must. So it's not like something luxurious. It is a must to be there. And everything else matters as well. Synergistic relationship between knowledge management and technology. When we have a synergistic relationship, we have a relationship in which technology and knowledge management together become bigger. Synergy is when the effect of two things is higher, is the, the effectiveness when two or more companies, for example, or people combine and work together. If, let me give you one easier example, if one plus one becomes three, then we have synergy. So technology and knowledge management together, they create this synergy. Reduce the cost and speed of the process of transferring best practices and knowledge, however, beware of informational overhead. So best practices are the tacit knowledge. We talked about them. Yes. As Mustafa said, synergism means the effects of two things must be higher than adding them. So one plus one is three. But normally one plus uh, one should be two. So that's why when technology is added to knowledge management process, there is a synergy. So the best practices are transferred through technology by a reduced cost and higher speed. Make sure you know that buying systems and implementing the state-of-the-art architectures does not guarantee the sharing of knowledge. The whole fact is about the technology. Technology is not knowledge management. So if you buy the system from Cisco, for example, and you, inst you install it, it doesn't mean that you're going to have a fantastic knowledge management process tomorrow. No. It enables us. It enables, but it does not guarantee. Technology must be good and easy to use to capture right information and disseminate it to the right people at the right time. So technology should be the very good technology, user friendly. When it says capture the right information, it means that you know that you have purchased the right technology.
because you know what kind of information you are working with and you know what kind of technology you need to handle that. What is written here by Navid? Synergy is then if I do the job, one job in one hour, if Navid do the job in one hour, then me and Navid work together, we do the job in 10 minutes, not half hour, in 10 minutes, because the combination of Navid and I is very well beyond the individual work. The, combi the effect of our combination is so high that if we do the job individually, is totally different from the way that we do the job together. Very well. There are certain helpful guidelines here. Determine whether the current technology can be adapted or can be purchased off the shelf. So when you want to manage your knowledge, you work with information and you need to make sure that you need to build the technology, the software and everything, or you need to buy the package one. Assess the ability of physical infrastructure currently in place to handle the kind of quantity of the traffic moving around the internet. Identify internal support requirements. So all these are the technical guidelines you need to, to consider. Like consider initial cost, including software, shareware and software, as well as secondary costs like training operations, so all these technical matters for the system. So commonly used technologies right now is database knowledge, uh, document management, intranet, group work, and collective tools, and these are all the things that you see which one is more popular and which one is the least popular. So the last is infrastructure, includes the transfer specific mechanisms, put in place to ensure the knowledge flow throughout the organization. So uh, the transfer specific mechanism is like technology, work processes, uh, networks of people. All of these are called the transfer specific mechanism. The organizational structure surrounding the processes are the people who, who organize into roles, systems, and structures to make transfer happen. Senior level of knowledge management executive also fall under organizational structure surrounding the processes. Another part of infrastructure is the cross-functional management processes that incorporates knowledge management into organization. Who approves the budget? who is going to pay for it, who is going to implement it, who owns it and accountable is accountable for the results. So these are all the factors that you need to answer in an in infrastructure discussion. Barriers to knowledge transfer. Sometimes knowledge is hidden and you don't find it. People don't know what it is. Uh, the hidden people don't know what it is that they know. And someone else needs to help them. So the knowledge is hidden in a sense that you are looking for something, but you don't know what exactly you need. This is one part of the problem. Another part is blindness. You know, you are you have a problem with the with the system. 
you have a sales reduction, your sales dropped, your sales dropped and you are looking for a reason for that. But you don't know because you look at the sales data and you have a lot of information but your problem is that you cannot define the problem. Therefore, you don't know what it is that Okay, let me let me rephrase this. The hidden knowledge is that you you own certain knowledge, but it's like a tacit knowledge. And this tacit knowledge exists in your mind, but you don't know that you have this tacit knowledge. You don't know how to use this tacit knowledge. Therefore, it's a knowledge in part of you, you cannot access it. You just know how to do it. And, and that's, that makes it difficult for you to use this knowledge because it's just there. You are not aware of it. And it's a hidden knowledge. On the other hand, the blindness is people suspect that it exists but don't know how to find it. So you know that in blindness that the knowledge that you are looking for is exist in the organization. But you don't know how you can go and find it. You don't know, is it in marketing department or is it in sales department or is it in operation management department or is it in human resource management department? So you are blind to where the knowledge is. Yes, exactly. What Navid says is a hidden knowledge. You can do things, but you can't explain how to do it. Therefore, the knowledge is hidden within you. Exactly. You don't have access to that kind of knowledge. Locked up tacit knowledge. Locked up tacit knowledge is the tacit knowledge which is very hard to express and difficult to codify. The real valuable knowledge remains stuck. Locked up tacit knowledge, the difference between tacit knowledge which is locked up and hidden knowledge is that in hidden knowledge you own the knowledge what, but you don't know what it is that you know. You just know how to do it. Tacit knowledge which is locked up, you know what you know. You exactly know how you do things. The problem is you don't know how to write it down. You don't know how to make it in a manual. You don't know how to draw a flow chart. So, very good. An example would be the usage of language by children. A child speaks the language, but if the mom asks a a three-year or four-year-old child or a five-year-old child to write the sentence, the child cannot. So this is a locked up passive knowledge. You should find a way to release this knowledge. It also happens when, when an employee goes on a business trip and learns a lot of things in his trip, in his uh, communication with the other company, other branch. But when he comes back from his trip, there are a lot of information. He doesn't know where to start, how to write it down, how to really transfer this locked up passive knowledge, the things that he learned. And that's very different from hidden knowledge because in hidden knowledge you don't know even how you do it. So even you are not aware. The hidden knowledge is like 
and then you learn something uh, from your father it you're a carpenter you just do things fabulously like a painter a great painter he can he can draw fantastic painter painting but if you ask him how you really do that he doesn't know he says I, I take the brush in my hand and I just do it that's it sorry I am too busy it's another problem even if the transfer would save them time still they don't have time to save time so it's the problem of being busy but even you know that if you share this knowledge with your assistant your assistant can help you and this gives you some more time and still you don't have the time to do that so you are over occupied implementation is hard it remains under construction in a sense that either you don't have money in order to implement the system so that you can release the knowledge or you are afraid of change or the leadership is weak or you're afraid of change of management many reasons makes implementing the knowledge transfer very hard imagine you want to transfer the knowledge from one engineering department in for example in Asia to another engineering department in North America it takes a lot of money in order to really establish mechanisms face-to-face -face, interactions travels documentation because you have to codify a lot of knowledge so it costs a lot to transfer engineering knowledge from one department in another continent to another one or the process of change you are afraid that this changes the everything because they lose all the power or many psychological reasons or anything so implementation the practicality is the problem here in here the problem is that you don't know how to deal with the knowledge in here the practical items are at stake so knowledge sharing share has two meanings to give away a part or to hold in common so when you share your your food with someone that someone is going to eat half of your food so you give away a part and this part could be half of it to hold in common when you share your refrigerator with your friend that friend is not going to eat your refrigerator just you hold the refrigerator in common so knowledge sharing creates value and according to locked up theory it leads to action and how this happens share the knowledge with the purpose of holding it in common is then everyone accesses the knowledge and benefit from it normally companies must share knowledge and best practices to create value and the value is created by translating knowledge into action okay so if there is no action there is no value and so the aim of knowledge sharing is value creation for organization and customers 
customers benefit from new products and services and organization benefit through profit generations. So the emphasis is on the, on the new process development because new process cut the cost for organization and bring the comfort to customers. One example will clarify this. Dell direct online selling model, which cuts the co costs the cost by eliminating the broker. So when you want to buy Dell computer, you go online and you choose your computer and they send it to you. So there is no shop, there is no, uh, there is no person who sells you the computer. So this in the middle you save some cost, the company saves some cost, the customer saves some cost, so the computers become cheaper. So they can have a computer with a reasonable price due to saving on this middleman. Therefore, the knowledge sharing should create value and according to locked up theory, if can be translated into action when the knowledge shared. Yes, we are going to have presentation as well. So companies must share knowledge, the best practices to create value, and value is created by translating knowledge into action. The bottom line is, if your knowledge is locked up, and is not translated into action, there, sh there is no value. So, if the knowledge is released and it is not locked up, then action happens. So, the lockup theory says that you should release the knowledge in order to have action. Well, um, it's going to be a few slides on value proposition and I just, because value proposition is a practical example of uh, how you, you share knowledge, uh, I, I'm not sure, uh, it's, it's a lot of a slides. So if we go through it, I'm afraid we run out of the presentation. We listen to presentations, and if you have time, I will go through this later. So who is going to present now? Mohammed Aziz. This point, the, the last end point has been mentioned on the uh, last slide. So organizations must also achieve five level of innovation maturity, which in the identify organization critical for learning and applying the uh, that learning in the day to day operation of organization. So uh, this is the, the fifth stage of modern, uh, which is shown uh, for the uh, high income innovation. Uh, the, uh, the direction, the, the vertical direction, you are seeing the performance, high income innovation, and the uh, horizontal direction which shows the practice of high income innovations. So we have the five stages that uh, on the next slide I will uh, uh, go on details. The high involvement innovation maturity levels are uh, one, background improvement that are ad hoc and short term. Second, the structure formal attempts to create high involvement innovation. Actually, I involvement innovation is directed at the organization goals and objectives. Uh, 
for we are I involved in innovation becomes proactive, largely self-driven by individual and groups. Uh, five, I involvement innovation becomes the uh, dom dominant culture of the organization. These five uh, stages which has been mentioned, uh, they are all one by one uh, steps uh, in the organization and company while they are do, uh, going to settle the I involvement innovation. There are also stages in the evolution of I involvement innovation capabilities. Stages of development and all which part we have the typical uh, process. Number one, natural background involved I involvement innovation. Uh, here the the, correct, the typical characteristic of problem solving random, uh, no formal course with structure. The presentation uh, first punctuated uh, by inactivity and non uh, participation. Dominant mode of problems is by specialists, short term benefits, uh, no strategic impact. Second, the structured eye involvement uh, narration. Uh, the characteristic or formal attempts to create and sustain eye involvement innovation, use of a formal prob uh, problem solving process, use of participation, training in basic eye involvement innovation tools, structural idea and management system, recognition system, often our own system to operations. Go, uh, number three, goal-oriented eye involvement innovation. All of the above, uh, plus formal employment of strategic goals. Uh, monitoring and uh, measurement of eye involvement innova innovation against these goals. And uh, in line system. Uh, number four, practice and empowered high involvement innovation. All of the above plus the responsibility for mechanism, planning, etc. Uh, they want to problem solving unit. Internally directed rather than externally uh, directed involvement innovation. High levels of experimentation. These were all the uh, the stages in the evolution of eye involvement innovation, including the typical characteristics. Uh, uh, in the last slide, there uh, uh, is advice for the future managers. Implementing eye involvement innovation will need skills in dealing with uh, questions like this. Uh, questions, uh, there are the a few questions and also a response which is required. A uh, question, what is in it for people? Uh, it's uh, putting in place some form of education slash reward system which acknowledge their contribution. How to do? Training and a skill. A skills development around problem uh, problem fi finding and solving and related innovation capabilities. Also setting up suitable vehicles, problem solving team. Uh, teams, uh, quality circle or whatever to carry through CI uh, activity. The CI is uh, continued improvement at the last year. Who is going to help support the identification and training of suitable facilitators uh, uh, commitments of uh, senior management to support and to find the cause? How will this fit in? Ensure that organizations, uh, structures, and system supports rather than block 
uh, continuous improvement we have here. Making a space and time available to carry out uh, continuous improvement activities. How we will how will the the flow of ideas be managed? Putting in uh, the the response will be putting in place some form of idea management system and how to maintain momentum. In short, this is more than another fashion statement by the organization. You have Planning two minutes, Mohammed. Yes. You have, you have yes. two yes. minutes. Let me finish, uh, dear sir. Planning for long term strategic de uh, development of uh, continuous improvement capabilities. Linking continuous improvement, uh, the organization development strategy. Where and how to get started. Identifying suitable pilot areas like uh, teams and projects. Uh, these were all the advices uh, which how we can implement the iron board innovation uh, in, uh, uh, which needs the skills in the project. So uh, the, the slide is finished. Uh, I hope you enjoy if there is any question on, on your service. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mohammed. Please ask your questions from Mohammed if you have any. It was a very interesting presentation. You also used a lot of new material. So it was Thank very you. good and you finished it very well on time. And uh, students can, can use these uh, PowerPoint if yep. they want yep. to have more information on, on how involved the innovation. Okay? Sure. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you very much. Thank you. So who is the next presenter? Aman Navari. Uh, Najib and Aman. So, so, which one should I pick, Najib or Amman? Okay, let's let's see. Let's go with Najib uh, and then Amman, or Amman can do it also next week. Uh, Abdullah says A is first. What, why do you mean A is first? Ah, Aman, okay. Okay, let me see if I have Aman. Aman presentation. Aman, I don't have your presentation. Okay, let's do with uh, with um, with Najib and then uh, Aman. Uh, I try to find your presentation in my email. Please send it one day before so that I have time to do it. Okay, go ahead, Najib. Uh, let me see, Najib. Go ahead. I'm making you the presenter. And the class fellows, uh, do you hear me? Uh, my presentation is uh, about training and development in the context of uh, 
uh, managing innovation uh, as is presented in the lectures by professor so uh, I want to focus some more and elaborate this Change the uh, with the next slide. I don't know how to go. Upstairs, go. go up. There is a there is there is a toolbar on the top. You can use it to change the slide. I cannot change it for you because you are now the presenter. Look at the top. Look. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I come up with a. Uh, uh, definition of the training that uh, what's the difference between training and development that training is a formal and systematic modification of the learning uh, that uh, that's done by education and instru instruction and development is more uh, to the future goals of the organization and uh, relates to the vision uh, of the organization and it's a uh, it is uh, any learning activity which is directed towards future needs rather than present needs and which is concerned more with career growth and immediate performance. Uh, yeah, of course, there are many, uh, there are many uh, definitions for this in different contexts, but I come up with uh, this specific one. There are many uh, important uh, uh, training and development, uh, especially to enhance innovation in, in, the, in an organization. Uh, the first one is that to op optimum utilization of uh, human resource, which optimizes the human resource uh, utilization in the organizations and also its uh, development of the human resource in terms of training and knowledge. Uh, it also uh, helps the employees to get uh, new skills. Uh, of course, the skills that are needed for the uh, 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 the needed for the organization uh, daily activities to perform in a good manner, and of course, the productivity of the uh, employees and productivity of the outputs of the organization, whether it is a service or a, a manufacturing or whatever of an organization, it helps the productivity. Uh, and uh, very important that uh, by having the training and development, it enhances the, the teaming uh, spirit inside the organization. And this is the team spirit and teamwork is the core uh, for uh, for reaching uh, short-term and long-term goals in our organizations and uh, it also speeds up the output and uh, uh, it helps to reach the goals uh, uh, efficiently. Uh, and also the organization culture that is uh, that's to, be, to be made and to be uh, to be educated to the uh, employees that is done by training and development of course and the climate the organization climate that we need uh, uh, for a better performance of employees in an organization the climate need to be uh, uh, well enough to uh, to have a, a desired output of the work and the quality is al also uh, very important <coughs> that it can be achieved by the training and development. It improves the quality of the work uh, and the to have a healthy working environment it can be educated by the training and development uh, part of an organization strategy. Uh, and the health and safety that how uh, we can have a safe environment, safe use of equipment, and uh, healthy behavior with each other and 
with customers and with you know, subordinate and top management. Uh, of course, moral uh, is another uh, issue that can be communicated to the training and uh, development process uh, in our organization. Uh, and the image of the organization is uh, very well uh, publicized uh, because uh, uh, when there is a training opportunity and development in, in, a, in an organization, so uh, it uh, it owns and it gets a, a good image in the market. And of course, the profitability will increase because uh, uh, when the time is short and when the output is good, so profitability is uh, is guaranteed. Uh, yes. And the policies and organizations uh, uh, and the motivations can be also uh, developed by the training and development in the organization label. Uh, as discussed in today's lecture, that uh, there are two areas that can be focused through training in an organization. That so uh, mm, the knowledge area that was well explained in the lecture in lectures today, uh, and the technical skills that is a more uh, organization specific. That it it differs from organization to one organization to another one. Uh, uh, and the knowledge area, uh, the trainees learn more about the sets of rules and regulations and about the staff and what product, product of the company and how it works and how they are linked. Uh, and the aim is to make a new employee fully aware of, aware of what goes inside and outside the company. Uh, this is more procedural. Uh, uh, knowledge that is uh, that is that can be general, but of course specific to the organ organizational uh, uh, structure and the technical skills, the employee, the specific skills so like operating a machine and uh, how to handle a computer. Uh, of course, the computers are very common nowadays in all organizations, but. Uh, they can be uh, more specific, like having a specific software uh, used in organizations. So these technical skills need to be uh, trained for the new trainees. <coughs> there are processes that how to reach the goal and. Of course, the trainings are designed for specific purposes. So, how to reach? Uh, what are the processes? And there are uh, six processes. Of course, uh, they can be different. But I've chosen a model that is presented here. That the first one is decide the skills. What skills are needed? Like, uh, what to do a training need assessment of employees. At what training? They need and there are specific uh, specific uh, uh, procedures to uh, to know the needs of training and organization level and big organizations they they already have what skills are needed but for small and organizations with different with a different scope of work and changing scope and vision see that can be different. And that the second process is analyze the steps that are part of the scale, and that what steps need to be taken, and then go to that uh, what equipment are needed uh, to uh, demonstrate these scales, uh, and and then demonstrate the scales to the supported employees. Uh, that. This is this is the actual part of the training that, that is done and then supervised as the supported employees practice the skills. Uh, this stage is uh, this stage goes after the training. Like how these skills can be properly and effectively 
applied and uh, daily uh, activities, day-to-day -day activities of the organization. And the last one is the sex, uh, the how the skills uh, help uh, employees to develop their skills. Uh, it is it can be also called the evaluation stage of the skills and that can be done an annual basis or quarterly uh, basis. So it, can be, uh, it depends on the uh, type of the training. So after this evaluation, uh, the loop can start again and see what other skills are needed or what is missing. And uh, it is very much important that the training and development uh, uh, portion of uh, activity is fit in the business, the strategic plan of an organization. Uh, and there are some steps at how to reach this, um, to get to this uh, training and development stage. And of course, we should have this embedded uh, in the business strategy, in the missions and values and goals. They have to be there. Uh, and the planners should know about this and fit it in the uh, strategic plan of the organization. Uh, and the strategic training and development uh, initiatives, uh, uh, these are also uh, very important. Uh, the diversifying the learning portfolio, improving customer services, accelerate the pace of employee learning, capture and share knowledge is comes in this category. Training and development activities, uh, that uh, specific activities that is used for training and development can be the web base that is very easier uh, nowadays because uh, it's, uh, the resources and the uh, use for such uh, trainings are uh, much less than in compared to the uh, in class uh, and out of the job training and uh, make development planning mandatory and develop website for knowledge sharing that is a up to date uh, knowledge sharing and training resources increase the amount of customer service training because uh, when we have the our customers satisfied so it helps our business to grow and this is very important to that our customers, uh, customer services in a high level. And the metric that shows value of training, that what they have learned, what improvements in the performance of the employees are there. Uh, and we can check also the, uh, the impact of the training by uh, seeing the level of customers complain and is your turnover of the employees uh, if they, it is reduced uh, and also satisfaction of employees of the training. These are all the uh, strategic stages for the training and development. Uh, and of course nowadays this should be uh, part of the human resource planning that, that is managed by the human resource development. This is not only a uh, human resource department component, but it, uh, it refers to the uh, decision making uh, group of the company or the organization, uh, and also the planners of the organizations to, uh, to, to work on this. And the main goals of the human resource development is to increase the productivity, uh, to prevent obsolete. Uh, Obsolescence of skills in the company to develop the organization as a whole, uh, improve quality of the work, and to improve the standards and safety in work, and uh, the most important to reduce waste and accidents and, of course, turnover uh, that is caused by the uh, lack of knowledge. Uh, about the organizations about and about the work procedures. Uh, so uh, I think it's very obvious that 
the training and development has uh, 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 a very uh, impressive impact on the uh, uh, the way the organization works, and uh, it should be uh, it, it will be uh, uh, spending of money, of course, and that in this stage we can say uh, disadvantage of training uh, that financially will be out of out of money. Uh, uh, we will spend some money on this and. Uh, but of course, sometimes it can be disadvantage because if we spend our money and uh, it, it doesn't work as we expected, so this can be a disadvantage. Uh, and our employees can uh, go away because uh, if we don't have uh, any proper setting for them in the organization context, uh, like giving them some raise or bonuses or whatever uh, incentives so they can easily go away from the organizations and the investment on them in terms of providing them training could be wasted. Well, uh, in, in, this, uh, uh, in the small circle and in the organizational uh, uh, structure it will be a waste but and overall, it will not be a waste, but we are, since we are talking about the organizational structure, so it will be a disadvantage. Uh, and these are all the uh, uh, disadvantages of the training and developed training. Uh, and how we link it with the, uh, with the innovation that since innovation is very closely related to leadership, uh, and it is the leadership responsibility to uh, to think about this uh, part in the organizational structure. So, uh, leaders should have an imagining uh, process and designing how to design this, how to design this training and development process. This is the responsibility of the leaders and how to experiment it, uh, uh, how to apply this in the context of the organization and assessing that uh, in the daily basis or weekly basis. And finally, this is the responsibility of the leadership of the organization to scale that, whether their training had impact, uh, had a positive impact uh, or no. I think that's all. Um, my, as Mr. Ahmad said, that the time is over. Uh, so I'm happy to thank you all for hearing and if any questions, more than welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Najib. It was very brief and a uh, little bit over time, but uh, it was it was a very good presentation. So, does anyone have any questions? Uh, please ask your for your questions if you have any. Okay. Um, now we had uh, Najib. Uh, let me put down your full name here. Okay, uh, Mirway sent me um, another presentation. Is it your first presentation, Mirway? Uh, Najib, thank you. I make myself presenter. Mirway? Okay, my voice is not there. So, I can go for one more presentation. Um, who is going to present next?
Okay, let's do it with uh, with Amman. because his presentation is also very brief and to the point. Okay. Uh, make Aman the presenter. Let's go, Aman. You got 15 minutes. Yes, Hakmal has a question, I guess. He raised his hand. Hakmal, what is your question, dear? Ah, it was before. So, do you have a question from me or from uh, um, Najib? Okay then. Uh, Aman, please go ahead. Uh, okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, my my presentation is about uh, how to structure an organization to support the innovation. Uh, first, first, I want to. Uh, talk about what is innovative organization. Um, it says, uh, as the global economy expands, many businesses are transitioning away from traditional hierarchical organizational structure to more flexible, innovative organizational structures. A good example of such a structure is the matrix organization. Mac matrix organizational structure is a type of uh, contemporary or innovative organizational structures. Uh, now I want to talk about the traditional organi organizational structures. What is traditional organizational structure? The traditional organizational structure is a pyramid with a president at the top of a few vice presidents, layers of management, and the majority of employees at the bottom. Uh, it, it talks that the, the, the structure of the traditional organization is like a hierarchy type of, uh, like a tall organizational structure, which at the top is the president of the organization with a few um, vice presidents uh, at the lower level and uh, some layers of management, and at the bottom there are uh, employees. The traditional organizational structure emphasizes more on a strict division of labor, which means the categorization of labor and the specialization of labor. Uh, top-down decision-making, it means the decision-making is happening more in the top level uh, than the uh, low level at the bottom level. Extensive rules and procedures, again, uh, it, it more talks about the uh, rules and procedures for, for, uh, for uh, employees. Uh, the weaknesses of the uh, traditional organizations is it's slow in response to rapidly changing environments. It means uh, it uh, prevents organization uh, to respond to uh, rapidly changing environments slower to react to changes in market conditions. Uh, it says that if, if there is a change in the market, uh, it's slower, it makes the organization slower to um, react against that change. Less efficient in taking advantage of knowledge introduced from a variety of sources on the ground. Uh, the drawbacks of traditional organizations. Uh, there are uh, typically four drawbacks of traditional organizations, which is the first one is low creativity. It means uh, most of the time it prevents the employees to be creative. 
most of the time, managers um, make the employees to follow the approved procedures, uh, which is approved by the uh, management of uh, or management or top level of the organization. Uh, the communication problem in traditional organization structures, uh, most of the communication happens at the top level and comes downward, which uh, prevent the employees to communicate in, in flat and, and, and their level at the bottom level of the organization structure. The high cost, the next problem is the drawbacks is the high cost, which means in this type of organizational structure, uh, there are some various level of managers with high salaries, uh, which makes a lot of cost to the company, and company can reduce, by, by uh, removing from this structure, they can reduce the uh, level of managers and putting more money on uh, uh, recruiting, hiring uh, more line staff. Uh, the next is less happiness. It means that in this type of organization, uh, because of the decision making and communication problem, uh, the employees are less happy because they can't uh, they can tell their ideas, feedbacks, uh, and they they cannot communicate their uh, feedbacks to uh, high top level of the uh, organization. This is a sample uh, type of the traditional structure, which has a uh, tall structure, which at the bottom level, this is up to the level, manager levels, and the traditional structure is somehow like this. Uh, the contemporary organizational structure is in, in opposite to the uh, traditional organization, which can, we can say the uh, innovative organizational structure. Uh, the Contemporary organizational structures, uh, they, uh, somehow the flatten, uh, the, the, it flattens the traditional pyramid structure, which was the, the type of the traditional organization, facilitates the flow of information to all parts of the organization, which was a drawback of the traditional organization, uh, reduce response time to external and the internal demands. If there is a demand, uh, in the organization or outside the organization, uh, this 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 uh, structure makes it quicker to respond to uh, any demand. Uh, types of contemporary organizations can be uh, we, I have mentioned uh, three of them here: uh, matrix structure, which uh, I mentioned before, boundary free structure, and learning organization structure. Uh, we I will talk in matrix organization later on, on later slides. The week it, it, this this type of organizational structure just has some few uh, weaknesses, which is conflict may break out related to uncertainty about roles, role conflict between managers. Sometimes uh, the managers um, come into a conflict. Uh, which is which will be uh, described later in matrix organizations. Uh, in this slide, I want to talk about the matrix organizational structure, uh, identification of the uh, this type of organizational structure. Uh, it, th this type of uh, this organizational structure is more uh, in, in this uh, organizational structure. It's it's the work is on more on product groups rather than and functional part of the organization. Uh, it, it, the product groups uh, are groups of the employees, which is exist of uh, employees uh, from multiple functional areas of the organization. Uh, it, the product groups operate completely independent. Uh, and there can be co in this type of organizational structure. There can be coexisting functional groups. We will talk about uh, later. Talk about the func uh, functional groups and product groups. The function of the uh, matrix organizational structure is a specialized personal assembly from each department. It means um, most uh, there are product groups. And uh, the member of these product groups are collected from different departments in the organization, like engineers, 
structures and and and, and many other uh, finance and, and in, uh, many other uh, employees. Product group members work under product group manager. There is a dedicated product group manager for each product group. Product group disband at the end of project. It means once the project is finished, the product is there, and the project is finished, the product group member goes back to their functional areas and they, they work under the, their functional department. The benefit of the uh, matrix organizational structure, it fosters new ideas by collecting uh, different uh, ideas uh, from uh, by, by, by bringing uh, staff uh, and member of the product group from different functional areas. Um, it, it, there, there can be a lot of other new ideas. Uh, the next is quick solutions to problems. If there's a problem, and they can come together and solve the problem. There's one drawback of the system, which is the conflict between the heads of product group and functional managers. As I told you, the, that uh, the member of the group comes from different functional areas, and once the project is finished, they go back to their uh, functional uh, department. So sometimes it happens that the functional department managers call back their employees and the product managers want them in the team. So there's, there's, there's uh, a conflict becomes, it can, come up, comes up and, and that's the drawback of the uh, matrix organizational structure. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the design of the matrix organizational structure is some like, somehow like this. Uh, the, you can see the product group A, product group B, and product group C. There can be multiple uh, product groups which uh, you see that the uh, member comes from different uh, functional areas which is sales, design, and production. Uh, members comes from these three functional um, areas into a product group and a group manager leads the uh, group in the product team. Uh, contribution of fast organiza uh, of organizational structure for fast innovation. Um, in this part, I want to uh, elaborate on uh, seven keys of uh, key, key actions, which has been taken by many um, popular companies like Toyota, mm -hmm. IBM, uh, Microsoft, Sony, Hewlett Packard, and many other companies. Uh, for transferring from traditional organizational structure to uh, contemporary organizational structures. And these seven uh, key actions are uh, as follows. Delegations of, uh, this, uh, delegation of decision to innovation team, integration of uh, R&D into the business unit, co-location of team and departments, central innovation team, Central innovation funds, external interface for open innovation, merge and acquisition of department, uh, like merge and acquisition department, creation of merge and uh, M&A department and the structure. So uh, we, uh, I will go in detail with, with each of these uh, seven keys. Uh, delegation of decision to innovation teams. Uh, which means decision need to be delegated to the innovation team and other uh, in order to avoid delays and enable fast innovation. As I told you, in traditional organizational structure, the decisions are in top level of organization. And this stage, it says that the uh, innovation team should have the authority to uh, to decision making, which um, avoid delays and um, it, it enables fast innovation for the organization. And the uh, next is uh, get the innovation to the market as quickly as possible. Uh, for uh, uh, delegating the decision-making authority to the uh, innovation team, that uh, results uh, quickly uh, uh, getting the innovation quickly to the market. The next point is integration of R&D into the business units. 
It fosters the collaboration with the other departments, improves the preconditions for fast innovation. It means that uh, we can um, c c integrate the R&D department into business units. Uh, it means that uh, we can have uh, a, an innovation member in each business unit to help that uh, particular business unit in uh, research and development and um, doing the in innovation. Uh, collocation of teams and departments. Collocation fosters the integration of teams and departments and a free-flowing communication. Uh, in this part, it says that uh, the teams, uh, the innovation team members, uh, should should be collocated, uh, which uh, which result in free-flowing communication. It means they can come across and communicate the ideas between each other from different departments. Uh, central innovation teams, it means uh, that besides having uh, particular innovation members and departments, uh, we should have a central, uh, for, for enterprise companies, we can have central innovation team in the, uh, in the center of the company and head office, which uh, um, it, it says mainly utilized in case uh, when the motivation and resources source of individual divisions, categories, product groups, or brands are in, in, insufficient in order to get the respective innovation to market with maximum effort and at maximum min, maximum speed. It means if uh, the, the central innovation team can uh, help the other innovation members and teams in, in other countries and other departments uh, and, and other branches of the, the company when they're stuck with their uh, the introducing the innovation to the market. The central team can uh, support them and help them to um, uh, foster the process of uh, introduction of uh, innovation to the market. Uh, the next point is central innovation funds. Uh, when there's central innovation team, there should be a sufficient fund for the um, central innovation team so they can uh, a special budget to support the central innovation team. They, they can spend money for introducing the uh, innovation to the market. Uh, next point is the external interface for open innovation. To execute open innovation and channel uh, external solutions and ideas into the company. It means the company should have uh, an interface to open innovation which means the, to accept ideas uh, from uh, inside and outside of the uh, ex inside and outside of the company for better innovation merge acquisition departments as a, a special organizational structure of managing for fast innovation very open innovation merge and acquisition department there, uh, there sh it says that there should be m and a department in the organizational structure to um, implement fast innovation, very open innovation, and acquisition, merge and acquisition, and most of the companies like uh, Microsoft Office or, or Hewlett Packard, uh, HP, or Toyota, they they they, are, they have a emanate department which looks for um, expanding their companies and merging with other uh, the, uh, companies in 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 the world. Uh, getting uh, the, um, other companies and, and bringing them in, 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 the, in their company. An enterprise can significantly strengthen its innovation management by merging and acquisition. Uh, an enterprise company like Toyota uh, can significantly be uh, strengthened in innovation management. Uh, so this is the, the Thank are, you very the much, Ahmad. I have used for uh, making this. It was very Thank nice. You, I have only one question. If you want to uh, talk about the role of knowledge management in the traditional versus modern uh, structures, how do you how do you connect that? How do you connect knowledge management to? Sorry, how sir? do you connect knowledge management to modern structure rather than traditional structure? Because 
because you say that in the traditional organizational structure there is a communication problem. Okay? Can you hear me? So, uh, sir, uh, with the uh, contemporary or modern uh, organizational structure, as as I, I said, it, it improves the communication uh, and the knowledge management also improves by improving the communication. So the the employees uh, send their feedback, uh, send their ideas to the organization, and then it can be. Uh, chain to information and, and then so to knowledge. Knowledge uh, management in, actually, uh, knowledge in management in increases uh, <laughs> communication. On the other hand, when they start communicating and sharing knowledge, it self creates the culture of knowledge management. True? Hello? Hello. Okay. So, so when they when they communicate, really? Really? yes, when they communicate, yes, they yes, promote yes, the culture of knowledge management. On the other hand, when there is knowledge management, knowledge management promotes communication. It's it's two way. It's like a circle. It's like a circle. Okay. Uh, Thank yes, you. Sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All just remember that you, you, next semester, next session is the exam. So I think there is uh, no. Uh, only Hackmal is going to present next 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 uh, week. Aman presented. Najib presented. Um, Mohammed Aziz presented, Mirwais is absent, and uh, next week I'm going to have your exam presentation. So we should lock with that. If you have any questions, please ask me now, or I'm going to close the session. Okay, have a very nice evening, and... Uh, Oh, exam presentation, your second presentation is your exam presentation. Your second presentation is the one that is considered as your final exam. That is called exam presentation. So I'm going to ask you more questions. I'm going to see how you respond to my questions. Uh, please read the last email I sent you. Sure, I'm going to send you all again, okay? All right. Any questions? Today, uh, today, all the presenters got A plus. Very good presentation. Today, all got A plus. Okay. Have a lovely evening. Take care. Write to me if you have a question. Bye bye.